Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> oh. Oh. Thanks. That was awesome. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you're all excited. And I really hope you brought your swimsuits, because you're going to dive into a unique story. Right now, we are here in the town of Panish, a town I hold very near and dear to my heart. Off the coast of Panish, please, yes, there are the beautiful Berlangas Islands, famous for their natural beauty, their tranquility, and their natural resources. They are so special, in fact. They are a designated protected area, part of UNESCO heritage. The Berlangas are also famous for another reason. Who's been there? Well, lots of people. So if you've been there, I'm pretty sure you never forgot the boat ride. I'm sure your stomach still remember it. Yeah, the sea is so rough here. The trip is anything but smooth. Well, I have to confess I had never been there until August 2017. Very early in that morning, I set off by boat. Almost an hour later, there I was, in Berlanga Grande. And almost an hour later, there I was, swimming all the way back to Peniche. Yes, swimming. Hey, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> In under five hours, I made it to shore. And I made history. Yes, I'm very proud to say I am the only Portuguese woman who has done that. Thank you. Thank you. Do you know how far that is? 16 kilometers. 16! And it's considered the hardest swim cross in the country because the sea is so rough. It was such a huge accomplishment. Please. Even the mayor came to greet me. He came to hug me when I arrived. Here's Tose, yes. Yeah, how did I do it? You may be wondering. With a lot of physical training, obviously. But also with neuroscience, meditation, and East Asian philosophy. Please allow me to explain. Now you will help me explain. <laughs> so if you could hold on to this and pass it around. Thank you. And you too, please. Thanks. <sighs> the red thread of fate is an East Asian belief originating in an ancient Chinese legend. According to this myth, Yue Lao, the old lunar matchmaker god, ties an invisible red thread around the ankles of those that are destined to meet or destined to help one another in a certain situation. I believe that throughout my life, many such invisible red threads have been connecting me to people near and far, establishing strong bonds, and connecting me to convictions, establishing commitments with mental and physical health and with compassionate generosity. Curiosity nourishes your soul and keeps you alive. I've always been extremely curious, especially about the brain. I wanted to learn everything, and I was wondering, as a small kid, I was wondering about the wonders of the brain. And I would think, hmm, how do we learn? What's going on in there? At the age of three, I taught myself how to read and write. That was awesome, but it was also a big problem. Because when I went to school, I had nothing to learn, really. And I could have got bored to death and just lose interest, but I didn't. I always see something as an opportunity. So I would look at the other kids and think, yeah, that gave me a whole lot of time to think. 
about life, about humanity, about everything, basically, about thinking. Yeah, thinking about thinking. Hmm. That's meta-thinking. Unbeknownst to my young self, I was already meditating then. In 1991, when I was 16, I was so lucky. I went to live in Macau with my parents. Moving to Asia as a teenager totally changed my life. So much so that some of my friends from Macau are here today. Thank you, guys. Yeah, as you know, I was curious about everything. So I read everything I could about Buddhism and Taoism and Confucianism. And without realizing it, I started absorbing all that Eastern way of life, all that compassion and gratitude that Chinese people are so famous for. And uh, instead of hanging out with my friends, sorry guys, uh, <laughs> at coffee shops and bars and, yeah, let's be honest, doing pretty much nothing like teenagers do, I would hang out with the monks at Buddhist temples and with the elderly at idyllic gardens practicing Tai Chi and Qigong and meditating, always meditating. Yeah, countless hours of meditation for over 27 years now have undoubtedly provided me with the necessary resilience and mental strength to endure such ultra-challenging ultra-marathons. Yeah, I was so curious about the brain, I had to study it further. So I went and I pursued a master's degree at Imperial College in biomedical engineering, and then a PhD in neuroscience at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, a very prestigious Ivy League school. It was an amazing experience. And then again, I wanted to learn everything I could. So I worked in a bunch of different labs, day and night, in a wide range of areas, from neurosurgery to neuromorphic engineering. So you could find me one day in the lab, dissecting a human brain, and the next day, building a brain in silicon. Ever since I finished my PhD in 2007, I've become really interested on the effects of meditation on the brain. So I was a meditator, and I was a brain expert. Why not combine the two knowledges and understand what's going on in your brain when you meditate? I practice mindfulness meditation which brings you to the present moment, lets you pay attention to your thoughts and your emotions, acknowledge them and let them go. It helps you develop attention control. It helps you regulate your emotions. And it helps you become more self-aware and more aware of others and of what surrounds you. Oops, sorry. Several brain areas have in fact been correlated with mindfulness meditation. Studies have shown that different brain regions are associated with the three components I mentioned of mindfulness meditation. So for attention control, we have the anterior cingulate cortex and the striatum, two areas in the middle of our brains. For emotion regulation, we have multiple prefrontal regions right here on our foreheads the part of the brain that is more devoted to higher cognitive processing. And for self-awareness, we have also some prefrontal areas, the posterior cingulate and the insula, which is very related with consciousness. You can also see in this image the amygdala, which is a brain structure that is associated with negative emotional processing. Yes, you heard me well, negative. And it is also associated with, with mindfulness. People and animals who have very stressful lives tend to have larger amygdalas than average. In fact, if you grab a bunch of mice and put them in a very stressful environment, like a very hectic cage, for two weeks, their amygdalas will grow and they will get at least 10% larger. 10% in two weeks. Can you understand what stress does to your brain? Well, if we then remove those animals from the stressful environment and put them back with the other mice, they kind of adapt, but their amygdalas never shrink back to the original size. So stress has enduring effects on our brains. On the other hand, 
the amygdalas of meditators are smaller than average. That's why people who meditate are better able to understand their feelings and control their emotions. And until recently, neuroplasticity was like this big taboo. Nobody thought it would be possible. They thought that the brain would never change, but it does. And mindfulness is one of the proofs that the brain can change. Yes. Those areas that I showed and go, uh, suffer changes, both structural and functional changes. So there are measurable effects and long-lasting effects to the practice of mindfulness meditation. An established mindfulness pra practice has an enduring effect on your brain. Yes, meditation does change your brain. So in, in 2016, I decided to study meditation formally. I already had thousands and thousands of hours of experience, but I really wanted to become a certified instructor. And so I did a mindfulness-based stress reduction course, the famous eight-week program developed by John Kabat-Zinn, an emeritus professor at Harvard Medical School. Yeah, eight weeks. But uh, I decided to do it in one week only because, you know, I like it tough. <laughs> I did the intensive version, and I followed it by a one-week-long silence retreat, which I recommend to everyone. Really, it was amazing. Suddenly, it all came back to me, and it all made sense. I could finally put together my complex puzzle of existence and explain my life's rather nonlinear path. Mindfulness does not need to be associated with any religious belief, but it finds its roots in ancient Buddhist practices of Southeast Asia. Studying it formally, I realized that mindfulness was just basically putting into practice in daily life all the Zen wisdom and compassionate Eastern way of life I had entrenched so deeply in my body and soul while living in Macau as a teenager. And I felt home again. Can you feel how excited I was when I was finally able to see that everything I was talking about for such a long time was true, it was science. It was science. It was not only my personal experience. Neuroscience now explains the benefits of mindfulness meditation. <laughs> and I could finally convince all those skeptics that it was true. All those people who were making fun of me whenever I talked about meditation, which I do very often, honestly. They would go like, oh, there she goes again with that meditation stuff. Oh, Jesus, will she ever shut up? Uh. Or whenever they, find, they found me meditating, they would say something really nice like, oh, I can't believe you've just been sitting there for half an hour with your eyes closed doing absolutely nothing. Don't you have anything to do? <laughs> Told you guys, it's science. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh well, bringing it all together now, as a neuroscientist, a meditator, and an ultramarathon swimmer, I know that both meditation and long-distance sports challenging, challenges have an enduring effect on our brains. <coughs> really, you cannot swim for five hours in a row and come out the same person. In fact, after five hours of almost total sensorial deprivation of just me and the deep blue sea of nothing but body and mind, I emerge, literally, as a different human being with a different perspective in life. Yep, I feel different now. And I feel so privileged, so blessed. I have such a huge experience, such a rich life experience. I've traveled all over the world. I've met so many people. I've acquired so much knowledge from people from all walks of life. I felt the time has, had come for me to give it back to the world and make a difference. 
And so I started undertaking swimming ultramarathons for solidarity purposes, both in Portugal and overseas. Yeah, the Berlangas Peniche crossing last year was a fundraiser for the Peniche firefighters and for Cersei Peniche. And this year, in the first week of September, I did not one, but two ultramarathons. Not a good idea, definitely not a good idea. Two ultramarathons in one week? Please, kids, don't try this at home. <laughs> but I managed to raise a lot of money for the Portuguese Alzheimer Association. And all this is so important and so meaningful to me. I've decided to create my own institution to promote mental and physical value, health and instill values such as compassion and gratitude. I believe that mentally and physically healthy people build better, more sustainable societies. And that has an impact on a country's economy because people are less often sick and have less mental incapacity. So in the long range, it will benefit the whole country. Needless to say, harmonious societies contribute to world peace. As the Dalai Lama once said, if every eight-year-old in the world is taught meditation, we will eliminate violence from the world within one generation. May my humanitarian challenges keep touching people near and far. May friends and strangers benefit from my actions. May red threads of fate keep connecting me to people all over the world, establishing strong bonds of kindness. Now you have your own red threads. Can we all come together now? We are all connected now. What about you? Show me a red thread. What are your bonds? Thank you. Use your red thread. Make an impact on someone's life. Please. <laughs>